So Kant is profound, but he's also difficult to understand because he uses and creates an intimidating vocabulary. So in this video, I'll review some of the basic vocab and concepts that you need to start understanding the critique of pure reason. First, notice his book is called Pure Reason. It's pure because he's considering reason stripped of all its empirical content. He's not doing science or logic or math. He's considering what is presupposed in order to do them at all. To use a metaphor from video one, he's looking at the spectacles by which we constitute our world. Another phrase you should know is transcendental idealism. When you hear this, just think of the spectacle metaphor again. Transcendental idealism refers to the attempt to understand what must be in place, a priori and necessarily, in order to have any experience at all. It's an attempt to show what must be in the spectacles from which we constitute experience. So transcendental um, arguments are those that infer the conditions necessary for experience. And it's interesting that cognitive psychologists are now using this type of argument as well. So Kant was well before his time. A third word is intuition, and Kant uses this word differently than we do. It means for him to behold. The intuitions are the necessary conditions for sensory experience that which must be in the spectacles to experience anything at all, so to speak. So in the third video, I'll show you how Kant proves that space and time must be a priori intuitions. They are in the spectacles, not derived from experience or thinking. Okay, so let's look at the historical context by looking at Kant's predecessor, David Hume. Hume argued that knowledge is of two types. It's either synthetic or analytic. An example of a synthetic claim is on the left. The dog is on the table. Synthetic statements are a posteriori because we learn them from experiencing the world. We learn the dog is on the table from empirical experience. Such statements are not universal, nor are they necessary. And negating them, saying it's not the case that the dog is on the table, does not lead to a self-contradiction. However, analytic statements on the right side of the screen are contradictory when negated. For example, it's a contradiction to say it's not the case that all bachelors are single or it's not the case that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Analytic statements are a priori because we know them without referring to empirical experience. So for example, I don't have to interview every bachelor to know all bachelors are single. I know it by mere thinking, a priori and semantically. And Hume thought the same sort of thing held true for math. Analytic statements are also universal and necessary. They're universal because it's true everywhere that all bachelors are single and that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And they're necessary because it must be the case that all bachelors are single and that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Finally, Hume says analytic statements are merely relations of ideas because the predicate is contained in the subject. For example, 4 is contained in 2 and 2, and single is contained in the concept of bachelor. Now here's a really important point about Hume. He believed all analytic ideas are trivial forms of knowledge because they don't tell us about the world. Synthetic knowledge, on the other hand, is not trivial. It actually tells us something about the world, like the dog is on the table. It's based on our empirical sense impressions. So math and logic are analytic. They're trivially true. They're tautological. And Hume further argued that if a book contains neither analytic nor synthetic propositions, then we should throw the book to the flames, for it contains only nonsense. All right. Now, when you think about all this, Hume is considered an empiricist because he believed all non-trivial knowledge comes from empirical experience. Rationalists, on the other hand, believe some non-trivial forms of knowledge come from mere thinking alone. And Kant will synthesize these two positions and give us a third option. In the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant shows that Hume's fork is a false dichotomy. This is because there is a third type of knowledge that's universal, necessary, a priori, but it's not merely a relation of ideas. The uh, predicate is not contained in the subject. It's not merely a definition game. It actually tells us about the world, or is at least what is presupposed for experience of the world. Kant calls this knowledge synthetic a priori. It's the knowledge that comes from the spectacle, so to speak. It's the middle column in this picture. And as we progress through the critique, we'll better understand why some forms of knowledge are synthetic a priori. But keep in mind, it's a controversial issue. Um, here are some possible candidates for synthetic a priori knowledge. Uh, 7 plus 5 equals 12, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Right? Um, events uh, have causes. Right. Now, we know synthetic a priori knowledge cannot come from experience because it's universal and necessary, and you cannot get universal and necessary knowledge from experience because you can't observe the whole universe, including the future and the past. Nor is it analytic. It's not merely relations of ideas because the subjects are not contained in the uh, predicates, or predicates not contained in the subjects. Cause is not contained in the idea of event, like single is contained in the idea of bachelor. Always increasing is not contained in the idea of a line. We have to add a third concept, like our intuition of space, or third intuition, to see this geometrical truth. 
and we'll explore these more later, but for now just keep in mind that the whole critique can be seen as an attempt to answer one question. And that one question is, how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible? And as we'll see, it's only possible if you accept transcendental idealism, if you understand and accept the spectacle view of reality. So in the next video, we'll get into the meat of his arguments by exploring the strange nature of space and time. Thanks.